Okay. Right. Okay, so um, let's continue. Right. So, um, you know, when we look at these, um, I mean, this issue and see, okay, is it really applicable in today's church? Um, well, um, uh, or do we see a parallel in today's church? Uh, maybe not in the same manner like this, you know, but it would be in other things, you know. Uh, for example, you know, people might say, like I've heard like people saying, okay, when you come to church, you know, about offering, okay, make it le make it a, something very legalistic and say, okay, if you do not, you know, if you do not uh, uh, give an offering, then, uh, you know, these, these, these things will happen, right? Now, we know the whole thing of giving to the Lord and, you know, tithe and uh, and all that. We know that it's scriptural. It is there in the word. Uh, but God also makes it a very, very, right through scripture, you know, he makes it very clear. Even in, in you know, when you see in the wilderness, when they when they built um, the tabernacle and when, when God tells Moses, okay, ask these people to, you know all these materials okay this um, and this fabric these stones this uh, this uh, precious stones and gold and <laughs> and whatnot so god says you know let them do it out of a willing heart right and also we we looked in uh, looked at uh, you know second corinthians 9 um, and then it talks about very specifically about how we need to give Right. So give, while giving is in scripture and giving is definitely something that is biblical and well, God says that he will in, in Malachi, he says he will pour out, uh, he will open the windows of heaven and pour out while all that is there. But if we are going to make it a legalistic thing and say, you know, well, bad things would happen, good things will not happen if you do not give. Right. Uh, now that is manipulation. Right. Uh, so sometimes, you know, in the in the area of giving, in the area of uh, even sometimes baptism, right? Baptism, uh, because we want to sometimes what protect the testimony of the person. You know, it comes from a sincere place, sincere heart, but then we end up really, um, you know. Uh, making our teaching very legalistic right we say okay now you need to uh, you need to spend so many years you know, I, I, I want to observe the things in you i want to see how good you are how you know uh, how consistent you are in your life and then i will give you baptism now what a baptism now that is something that is not there in scripture now we see that uh, the Ethiopian official, the Ethiopian eunuch, was baptized by Philip immediately. Right? He believed, and then he, you know, you, you know that, right? The incident where he was reading from the scroll of Isaiah. He's going in the chariot. Philip has the conversation with him. He believes, and then he asks, which means he Philip actually told him about water baptism. So. The Ethiopian official asks, you know, hey, there is water, so what stops me? So Philip says, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And then go on and then goes on to uh, baptize him. So uh, we see that is again, you know, out of a matter of the heart, you believe. So but then we 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 can make it very legalistic and say, um, well, this is how it is. If uh, you know, this is uh, so it could be in the area of of you know giving. Uh, of a tree or tides uh, so we in today's church you know if you see a parallel we could slip back into the law or being legalistic and not live according to grace um, in these areas right so it will help if we reflect and if we see okay what are those things right uh, am i going back uh, into the law now having said that you no know, we I know that you know, as a, as a church, as a body, as an organization, um, there are processes and structures, and you know, so that is that is not something that we are, uh, you know, talking uh, of, right? Some something to get things done. We need, you know, we need a process. 
Um, so we're not saying, you know, hey, that is that means it's being legalistic. No, right? It's it's a series of steps that you need to take in order to do something effectively right? while it's an organization. So, um, so we're not talking about that, right? We're talking about um, matters of truth, and uh, you know, uh, when we when we make it legalistic in nature, right? Okay, so let's uh, let's continue with. Um, uh, with verse 10 in chapter 3. Okay. Um, yeah, chapter 3, verse 10. Okay, so here it is. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident for the just shall live by faith yet the law is not of faith but the man who does them shall live by them verse 13 christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law having become a curse for us for it is written cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree that the blessing of abraham might come upon the gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Okay, so, um, so he's saying, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. Right? Uh, when when it when it comes to the works of the law uh, and doing what the law requires and the standards uh, adhering to the standards of the law, so it means that you know everyone who does not do that. Uh, you know, who does not continue in all things, uh, well, continue comes under the, the consequence of not continuing in the law. Right? You keep one thing and you break other things, or you break one thing, um, well, you you suffer the consequence of it. Right? Which is, you know, so it so says, cursed is everyone. You know, you don't, you're not blessed, but you receive a, negative blessing you receive the opposite of that so curse is everyone who does not continue in the things of the law um, and you know that no one is justified so is from deuteronomy right deuteronomy uh, 27 now it says that no one is justified by the law is very evident because in habakkuk uh, so paul refers to that scripture says uh, where habakkuk uh, clearly Right, that the just shall live by faith. So he's referring to that scripture. So how do the just live? They live by faith. Faith in what? Or faith in who? Faith in God and in His, in His word. Right. So the just shall live by faith. So, um, so what does that mean? That means that, uh, well, to be justified. And to live a life of justification, right? Uh, li live live a life after you are justified. It is by faith. It is not by going back to the law or keeping the law. The just shall live by faith. Okay. Um, so then, verse twelve. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. So the law is not of, it's not of faith, it's actually a, a works, a series of works. Uh, but the man who does them, you know, this law shall live by them. You need to continue in it. Okay, so you not. so what Paul is saying is you can't mix grace and law together. Okay, so that is what is implying that you can't mix. You can't, you know, now you received Christ by faith uh, and it's because of grace you received uh, Christ. The, the works of the Spirit, uh, the miracles you received by faith. Now, you cannot mix that along with the works of the law because the law, this is what it says, that if you continue, those who live by the law shall continue in it and then because you're not able to keep the law, you need to suffer the consequence of the law. Right? Um, but, you know, the good news is this, that the Lord Jesus, he took upon himself the consequence of not keeping the law, right? On the cross, when he took our sins upon himself, he, he, upon himself, he also took the punishment for that, right? The consequence of that. What was the consequence? The consequence of not keeping the law. The consequence of us not keeping the law, he took it upon himself. 
right? Um, so here, uh, Paul is actually differentiating between the fact that you can't, I mean, or he's just stating the point that you cannot mix both, okay? Because they were mixing both. They were saying, okay, I live by grace. I believe and continue to believe in Jesus, but also, you know, be circumcised and keep all these things. So you can't mix. Uh, verse 13, Christ has redeemed us. Okay. Praise God. It's a, it's a done thing. It's something that was done in the past. When was it done? It was done on the cross. So he's saying, Paul is saying, look back. Something happened. Something happened when Jesus went to the cross. And what he did on the cross is so significant today, right? It's it's applied for you, for your life. Now, how is it apl applicable? Redemption. Christ has redeemed us. He did something. He has redeemed us. He has taken us out. He has restored something to us. He's taken it out. Right? He has redeemed us from what? From the curse of the law. He has redeemed us from the curse of the law, from the negative consequences, from the punishment of not keeping the standards of God, not, mean, not meet, meeting or, uh, you know, not raising up to meet the expectations, the standards of holiness, the standards of righteousness, um, everything, right? So Christ has actually redeemed us. He's taken us out. He has saved us. He's brought us out from the curse of the law. He has protected us, shielded us from the curse of the law, from the punishment of not keeping the law, from the consequence of not being able to continue in the law. Now, he has redeemed us. Okay, How did he redeem us? It says, having become a curse for us. Because cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So he became a curse for us. So that we could be blessed, right? A very important truth. So he's, he's again talking about what the the magnitude of what Jesus did for us on the cross. You know, you're going back to the law, you're going back to circumcision, you're going back to all these Jewish customs and everything. Let me remind you. Right? He says, let me remind you. If you're actually doing that, you know, in the previous chapter, he says, if if you he said, if you're actually doing that then I want to tell you that actually Christ died in vain, right? So here he's saying, if you actually did that, you know, you're, you're not actually receiving uh, from, from him. You know, I want to remind you that you are actually redeemed. You are redeemed from the law, from the works of the law, from the negative uh, consequences or from the curse of the law, you are actually redeemed because you could not keep it, but you are taken out of it. And who has redeemed? Christ has redeemed us. How did he receive? How did he redeem us? He became a curse for us on the cross. I want you to, you know, he's saying, I want you to remember that. I want to remind you of this great truth, right? So curse is everyone who hangs on a tree. Okay, so he redeemed us. Verse 14 is even more significant. He says that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ. Okay, um, let me just share the notes here. Okay, he redeemed us that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles. Um, yeah, there it is. Okay. Okay, so um, well, <clears throat> I think we've studied, you know, uh, what is the what are the or what are the blessings of Abraham, you know, in relationally, uh, you know, spiritually, uh, like he was a he was he was a friend of God. He has the kind of faith that he had, uh, the the possessions that he enjoyed, uh, the victory over his enemies, and and all that you know, the blessing of Abraham. And in addition, I know in, in Deuteronomy talks about, um, I think it's Deuteronomy 18, right? Where it talks about uh, um, the, 
the blessings and it also talks about the curse of not keeping the law right so we you know we've gone through that um, and we see that christ has redeemed us christ has redeemed us from the uh, from all the curses of the law and released us into blessing so that's the beautiful part that he has actually released us into blessing so that we might receive the blessings uh, of abraham that we might um, receive that in christ right so deuteronomy yeah um, um okay so we um so not not 18 um it's in 28 um so we see uh, the blessings we see the curses and everything and um the whole chapter right it's um so every blessing in it uh it's for us because Christ became a curse for us and he redeemed us from the curse of the law. So every blessing uh, you, you see here is for us. And every curse that is listed there, Christ has redeemed us. So that's the good news. Right? Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. So because this, these, these are the, the curses of not being able to keep the law or not continuing in the law, not continuing in obedience. So Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. So um, we can walk joyfully. We don't have to fear any curse. Uh, we don't have to fear anything. We can walk in confidence. We can walk joyfully. We can walk knowing that we are accepted by him. We are walk uh, you know, confidently knowing that um, he has made us righteous. He has clothed us with his righteousness. Right. So, so this is what has happened. And how did it happen? By faith. It was a it was a it was through grace, through faith, um, and it was by uh, by faith, it was through grace. Right. So um, so he, he goes on to explain a little more further, uh, a little further here in verse 15. Okay, he says, Brethren, I speak in the manner of men men. Though it is only a man's covenant, yet if it is confirmed, no one annuals or cancels it or adds to it. Now to Abraham and his seed, where the promise is made, he does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as to one, and to your seed, who is Christ. And this I say, that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant which was confirmed before by God in Christ that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Okay, so again, uh, Paul is saying, you know, uh, you know, if there is a natural covenant made, an agreement made, <laughs> uh, between men, I'm sorry, between two men, two parties on on the earth, no one can, you know, annul it because it's it's made by unless it is by those parties themselves. Now, no one can actually change it or cancel it because it's a covenant made with two parties, an agreement reached between two parties, a formal agreement, right? So, um, so the same way. Now here is um, God telling Abraham and his seed to his seed where the promise is made. So now it's very interesting to see that uh, the father has actually made the covenant uh, a promise to the son, right? Um, it says, and to seeds, it does not say and to seeds as of many, but as of one and to your seed, okay? Um, that is in verse 16, right? So let's look at... Um, um, so this is what God says, and to your seed. Right? So He's talking about what will happen, you know, in the lineage of Abraham, that uh, there will be the Messiah who will come, and uh, and God is foreseeing that, and He is uh, that covenant has been made that, and to your seed, right? He's talking about. Uh, Christ, that many will be made, and in fact, it is a it is a uh, it is a covenant that is made 
and it's it cannot be annual so it cannot be changed so now it is of faith it cannot be by law whatever blessing that you receive um whatever uh, promises that you received uh, the, the 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 promise of the blessing that you receive the inheritance that you receive in christ it is not through the law okay uh, we'll look at it a little more uh, deeper uh, you know if, when we go on and this i say that the law which was 430 years later right so god makes this promise to abraham makes this covenant with abraham and the law came you know four centuries later so that cannot change it or uh, cancel because it was by faith that abraham received right the blessing it was by faith um so the so he's saying for inheritance if the inheritance is, is of the law then it is no longer of promise but god gave it to abraham by promise okay so is this proving over and over and over again that uh, there's no point in going back to the law that it is it is futile it is empty to go back to the law okay. verse 19 okay what purpose then does the law serve it was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator now a mediator does not mediate for one but god is one is the law then against the promises of god certainly not for if there had been a law given which could have given life truly righteousness would have been by the law but the scripture has confined all under sin that the promise by faith in jesus christ might be given to those who believe but before faith came we were kept under the god under god by the law kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to christ that we might be justified by faith but after faith has come we are no longer under a tutor okay so here paul answers that question you know what is the purpose of the law you know because in the old testament we say that there is a a, a, a big deal that was made about the law you know there's so many details and and uh, in fact god it was god who gave the law you know, all those traditions and all those things to keep etc so uh so for the jewish mind it was very difficult to to really come to understand or to receive the fact that salvation and justification is by faith okay i think you you've studied romans and the book of romans in that you know, paul again brings out very clearly so it's um so that was the argument right you know how can it be uh, now what is the purpose of the law you know we have been people who have kept the law so now suddenly you're saying that this righteousness comes by faith and not through the law right so here paul is asking you know the question what purpose does the law serve it was added because of transgressions Okay, the law was given because of transgressions why well the, the till the seed should come till christ should come to whom that promise was made like in abraham that promise was made to the to seed that in the seed through the seed all nations will be blessed that all people will be blessed right so now this promise that was made uh, that till the seed should come Okay, till that till christ should come this law was like a tutor okay the word used there is a tutor or a teacher um who would keep who would protect who would um uh who would direct uh, and keep the the people um 
okay so it was added because of transgressions and uh, let me just uh, go back to it um sorry i'm just looking at um Yeah. Um, yeah. It was uh, sorry. I'm I'm looking at verse 19 again. Um, that till the seed seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Okay. So um, so referring to the fact that um, uh, you know God Himself was the one who made the covenant. And he himself was a mediator, right, uh, for the covenant and uh, and for the promise. He himself was the one, and uh, and it was appointed um, till the seed should come. Now, so does that mean that the law is against the promises of God? Okay, is the law against the promises of God? So Paul is saying, you know, if there was a law. If there was a law which actually promised righteousness, which if there was a law which said, okay, uh, by this you will be made righteous, then righteousness would come, would have come through the law and not by faith. But um, scripture, the law actually, actually confined all under sin. Okay. It's brought everything, everybody under sin. Verse 22. Scripture has confined all under sin. How does it? How does it confine? Or how does it bring everybody under sin? Because it says, "This is sin, and this is not sin." Okay, but man, as uh, by nature, goes on to commit sin. Right, goes on to not keep the standards of God. So uh, has confined everybody under sin, has brought everybody under sin and say, okay, this person, okay, could not keep the law. He's now under sin. This this group of people, they could not keep the law. So they are under sin, right? So it's confined all under sin. Verse 20, the second part of it, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Okay, so they now, you know, if you look at a Jew, if you look at a non-Jew, now everybody is under sin, confined by sin. But those who receive the promise through faith, now the promise is to everyone who believes. You can be a Jew, you can be a non-Jew. Uh, it's for everyone who believes. And it's, it's through faith. This promise is given, the promise is received through faith in Christ Jesus. So it's not about the law. Okay. So now, but before faith came, we were kept under God, God by the law. Now, before this whole salvation, uh, before, which means that he's talking about the work of the cross, and till such time, the Lord Jesus came and carried our sin on the cross that we might believe in, in him and put our faith in him and receive the uh, receive salvation. Before you know, uh, faith came, we were kept under God by the law. So it was like the law was a tutor. The law was a tutor pointing us to the righteousness of God. The law was a guard uh, protecting us from things that were, uh, you know, from, from harm and danger, the consequence of uh, not keeping the law. So uh, was protecting us. We were kept under God, kept for the faith, which would, after we be revealed. Okay, so, so this is what the law did. What is the purpose of the law? The law actually confined everybody under sin. What is the purpose of the law? The law kept us uh, under God till we could come and exercise our faith. The Lord was our, uh, the, the law was our tutor, was our teacher pointing us to the standards of righteousness and so on. So, um, so this is what uh, had happened. Verse 24, therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ 
that we might be justified by faith. Now, this was the purpose of the law. It is not that the law was opposite or uh, was uh, opposite about opposite to the promises of God or against the promises of God. No, the law actually protected the person. The law actually brought the person so that uh, the person might believe in Christ, uh, that we might be justified by faith okay, through Christ. So when faith had come, now when you put your faith in Christ and when you are justified, now there is no uh, need for the for keeping the law. Okay, that is what he is again Paul is saying, right? There's no need for you to go back to the law. There's no need for you to keep the law, the traditions of the law, and, and all that. There's no need for you to do that. Why? Because the law actually served its purpose. It's brought you to Christ. It's kept you. It's confined you to sin, brought you to Christ. Now you have put your faith in Christ. You've received the promise. Now there's no need for you to go back to the law. And there's no need for you to you know, continue in the law. Okay. So uh, for those people who are you know, trying to do the law or you know, saying, okay, the law was given, uh, it is ancient, it is given by God, uh, therefore we need, to, you know, we need to obey. So he's giving them the reasons why the law was given you know, and why you, now you have to stop. Once you've put your faith in Christ, you do not have to go back. To the law okay so very clearly he mentions uh, about that okay now verse 26 for you are all sons of god through faith in christ jesus now here's the other okay let's just read uh, the rest of the verses for you are all sons of god through faith in christ jesus for as many of you as were baptized into christ have put on christ there is neither jew nor greek there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Okay, let's just read a few verses in chapter 4 also. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father even so we when we were children we were in bondage under the elements of the world but when the fullness of the time had come god sent forth his son born of a woman born under the law to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons and because you are sons god has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts crying out abba father therefore you are no longer a slave but a son and if a son then an heir of god through christ okay so wonderful he's talking about how you know the law kept you to, to come and protected you that you came to the place of receiving christ okay um now that uh, you are you have received christ here's another thing you are all family okay you are you are sons of god so that is the place place that you know you have received you receive not because of the law understand that through faith in christ you have become children of god sons and daughters of god you are a family of god Okay, so it goes, goes on to explain that you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus, which was not possible if you are just keeping the law. Okay, now something else has happened. There's a change, right? You died to the law, you became alive in Christ. There's a spiritual change, right? There, you, your spirit is born again. Your spirit is one with Christ. Right? All that is there, like in several other places where Paul talks about that. You are a new creation. You are one spirit with him and all that. So all that is bearing upon you know, this, this particular verse where he says, you are sons of God. 
Okay, so for as many as you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You've been baptized or immersed or placed in Christ. You know, spiritually, that is what has happened. You are one spirit with him. Right? You have, for as many have, have baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Right? You put on this new nature. You become a new creation. Therefore, verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, what is the meaning of that verse? That means that, you know, your status, you know, you, you all these differences, differences of who has got an upper hand or who is, you know, uh, not, all that, all those differences oh. are, are taken away and you are equal. That is what it means. You are equal now, right? Uh, you are, you are, you are the same. There's no partiality. There is no, you know, upper hand. Uh, you are all equal. Okay. So you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. You're the family of God. Now in a family, everybody is you know, treated equal. We could have different roles. We could have different things. Uh, we could all be in different levels of maturity, but then we are all equal, right? So as many as you of you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. So there's no question of, you know, Jew or Greek or nationality and because of which, you know, some are uh, greater or some are lesser. Uh, there is neither slave nor free. Okay, now when it comes to, you know, those days they were slaves. Um, so you're saying, you know, there is no difference in that now. You know, slaves were looked upon, uh, were looked down upon and, uh, you know, there is no such difference. Um, so here he's saying you are all one in Christ. You are all equal. You are all one in Christ. Now this is what happened to you um, as as believers in the Lord Jesus. You are all one in Christ. Then, and if you are Christ's, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise what is the heir one who receives an inheritance okay that is what an heir means one who receives an inheritance uh, one who receives an inheritance a family inheritance right one who receives an it could be like when you say heir it could be somebody who receives a uh, you know uh, like the head of the family or um you know, can actually leave an inheritance. It could be a house. It could be, uh, it could be property. It could be a land. It could be uh, maybe uh, money. It could be, you know, other things like gold or silver, whatever. As an inheritance, like now this belonged to me. Now this belongs to my son. This belongs to my daughter. Why? Because they are my heirs, legal heirs. Right. So here, saying that if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So what belongs to God now comes to you. You inherit it. And it's, it's something even more wonderful. So he's talking about the wonderful thing that has happened because of your faith in Christ. Now, the law, well, it had its role. It did something. It brought you, pointed you to Christ, kept you, to uh, kept you, you know, as a guardian. It was a tutor teaching you uh, what was right and what is wrong, and it brought you to the place of putting your faith in Christ. Now, put your faith in Christ. Now you don't have to go back to the law anymore. Now you, because you have become Christ. Now in Christ, there is a total change that has happened in your identity. There is no no one who's uh, you know uh, the, all the all the differences of inequality or partiality everything is gone, right? So uh, now you are Christ, and if you are Christ, then you are heirs of God, and uh, and you are you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Okay, now this is what happens to an heir, like even in a house you know that there, let's say there is a child and the child is a legal heir. 
the, the everything belongs to the child right whatever the parents whatever the father and mother possess or have you know maybe it could be a business that they are running it could be you know property it could be wealth in the bank whatever it actually belongs to the heir right but what happens you know the when when the when the when, when it's a little child uh, there's no difference between the heir and and the slave in the sense you know a servant who's working in the house because the the child does not get to enjoy the inheritance uh, because it's not received it and uh, but is kept safe by the guardians and stewards you know they could be you know if, of course the, if you just picture a very very um, wealthy family right they're having a lot of maybe servants and everything so the child is actually kept safe the child is uh, looked after right uh, of course by the parents and also taken care by the servants right uh, all the needs taken care of so saying but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father now the child is old enough the child is uh, uh, ready to receive uh, ready to receive the inheritance and enjoy the inheritance so until the time appointed by the father so he's saying even so we when we were children right um, we were in bondage under the elements of the world but now when the fullness of the time had come it's talking about the Kairos moment. The fullness of the time had come. Um, God sent forth his son. God sent forth Jesus. Born of a woman, born under the law. Okay, so he, he born the law was very much uh, in function. The law was functioning. Uh, so he was born under the law to redeem those who were under the law. Right? Uh, so when you say under the law, the law had uh, the upper hand or the law had um, declared everybody to be sinners. The law had declared everybody to be marked for the consequence of sin, condemnation. Um, so they were under the law. And what happened was this, to redeem those, the Christ came, the, the, the Lord Jesus came to to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive adoption as sons. So he has taken us from our, under the law, from out of the law, that we might receive adoption, that we might be adopted into a family and that we might be heirs, that we might receive the inheritance, which is a beautiful thing which is a wonderful thing that has happened to all of us so you know paul is just pointing the galatians to that you know you want to go back to the law don't you realize what has happened to you that you are heirs that you have received this inheritance well the law had its role in keeping you know you were kept safe you were, you were guarded uh, and and all these things happened but now um, because you are sons, verse 6, chapter 4, verse 6, because you were sons, I uh, just go there, um, because you were sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father, right? Because you are family of God, you are sons or children of God, God has sent forth the spirit into our hearts by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit testifies, or like we see in Romans, that the Spirit testifies to our spirit that we are sons of God. Let's look at that uh, verse. Let's go to Romans chapter 8, okay, Romans 8, uh, and verse 16. Uh, maybe we'll receive verse, I mean, read verse 15 and 16. Um, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. But you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit himself witnesses, witness, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Verse 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be 
glorified together. So, so he's pointing to that, right? Is uh, that truth um, is which he has been preaching and he has taught, and we see that in Romans as well. The, the position, the place that we have come to. So, he's saying that um, you know that uh, you are sons of God. God has sent forth the Spirit into your heart, by whom we cry out, "Abba, Father." Therefore, verse seven. You are no longer a slave. You, know, you are no longer a slave. You know, earlier it was like, um, you know, a child is not different from a slave, right? Because you are under the law uh, and you are in the house and you have this inheritance, but it's it's going to happen at a later time. Uh, but now he's saying you are no longer a save, slave. You declared you are no longer a slave, but you are a son and an heir of God through Christ. You are no longer a slave. You know, you've come to that place where the Lord does not have any hold on you anymore. You've received the promise of faith through Christ. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but you are a son. You are a child of God. And therefore, you you, you are your position to receive the inheritance and enjoy the inheritance in Christ. You are no longer a slave. And uh, But if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So he's just saying, you know, you are, this is the place of, of, you know, Christ has elevated you. This is the position to whom, to, to, to which you have been lifted up. Right? You have been lifted up to this, such a glorious place. How can you go back? How can you go back to the law? Right? In a, in a, it's just comparing and saying, there's no, there's no way you can go back to keeping the law. You become a child, you become a son, you become an heir. How can you even go back to the law? Okay, so we'll stop here and then continue with, uh, you know, verse um, four, sorry, verse eight uh, from next class. So we are, we've studied till, uh, so we looked at the whole of chapter three and chapter four, uh, till verse seven. Um, so we'll, we'll, of course, next class again. We'll we'll review this just so we, you know, all these things about the purpose of the law and everything. Uh, it, it becomes even more clearer, and uh, you know, it's uh, yeah, uh, it, it's 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 there in all clarity in our hearts. So we'll we'll just review that as well, uh, and then we'll move on to the rest of it, right? Okay, so we'll stop here. Thank you. God bless. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank God you, bless. Bye-bye.